After 146 Grand Prix, the streak is over for the big three. Welcome back to Motorsport 101. go back 146 races for the last time we had a race winner that wasn't ferrari mercedes or red bull yes this is a miracle welcome to episode 261 of motorsport 101 i think it's 261 am i right king yes Just it is 261 right, <laughs> <laughs> I, ri- I write it down in the set list now for a reason i do you, you do and i and i completely ignored that and i still got it right don't me. Uh, welcome to episode 261 of motorsport 101 and we are truly in the presence of a miracle so much so that one of us even dressed up for the occasion hello rj o'connell how's it going i'm just here to celebrate my team my beloved team from faenza italy once known for 20 years as minardi f1 team once known as scuderia toro rosso following the purchase of Minardi for, uh, by the Red Bull Soft Drinks Company, now known as Scuderia Alpha Tori, following the rebranding to promote their clothing line, my team that previously won the 2008 Italian Grand Prix at Monza with your friend and ours, Sebastian Vettel, has won again in 2020. It's a new day. It's a new era. I've got... I've got all the gear, thanks to uh, uncompensated sponsors at RetroGP.com. For my attire, uh, this flag I got on eBay, it's it's still really awesome. I am excited. Holy crap. <laughs> As you do. Like, it, it, I love that like, two of my co-hosts have had moments of glory this year on this show, in this motorsport year. And there's me being a Ferrari supporter, and our stock has never been lower. You can, I love it. It doesn't hurt at all. King, how's it going? Uh, g- going, going well. Uh, ex- excited for this upcoming weekend of MotoGP action. Uh, funnily enough, I did. I didn't see this race live. I watched it on a unintentional tape delay uh, later on that day because I woke up. Uh, I saw, I forgot who tweeted it out, but a picture of, of Gasly on the podium by himself, and pretty much the caption was like, man, whoever missed this race look at this picture is probably real confused right now, and I just replied, yeah, I'm real confused right now. I think it was, what the hell just happened, I think the crazy yeah. one looking for on your Twitter was. And that's entirely fair because we had a race winner in Formula 1 that was 500 to 1 to win this Grand Prix on Thursday in one of the all-time great Formula 1 shocks in modern history. Pierre Gasly is a Formula 1 race winner. No, that's that that's not a lie. That actually happened. And this podcast will try to deconstruct and break down just how we got to this point. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to take some time. So I'll get the housekeeping out of the way from now. You can find us right here on youtube.com forward slash motorsport 101. Unless you're listening to us via audio, in case you are. That's where our YouTube channel is. Our Twitter handles are right down below if you're watching on YouTube. If not, they're at Harrison101HD, at RJ O'Connell, and at Ryan Eric King. Cam isn't here for this one. Sadly, he's having a nap. He'll be back soon enough. Um, to be fair, he's probably still dreaming like Pierre Gasly actually won the race, and it's probably still just like something kind of Inception or something. Um, <laughs> the other way to find our podcast Twitter, you can at motorsport underscore 101. It's our Twitter account's fourth birthday of the day. Uh, happy Yay! celebration of the reboot, everybody. Way you love to see it. Um, you can follow us on there at motorsport underscore 101. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash motorsport 101. And if you really like us, you can back us financially on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash motorsport 101. Uh, we've got one more episode of catch ups to go through, and then we are officially back on pace. Woohoo! Um, but but, so I, episode will but be like, on. isn't it. We're, we're, since we're recording an episode now, <laughs> wouldn't that mean we're behind even? <laughs> What's happening it's, now is happening now. When will them be now? Soon. It's wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff, King. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> um, so until then, that's on the five dollar tier on our, on our Patreon, Patreon.com/slash/motorsport101. 
uh, $10 gets you into the supporters club of our Discord server where you can listen to these shows live as they're being recorded. And The Kick, the book written by me, is now in the $15 tier as well. So check that out if you haven't already. Let's get in to the Italian Grand Prix. <sighs> Oh my god, what just happened? Pierre Gasly is a Formula 1 Grand Prix winner and he held off Carlos Sainz's McLaren. Where was Mercedes? Where was Ferrari? Where was the senior Red Bull team? What just happened? So let's let's figure this all out. Let's go back to Saturday for a moment here because we've got to give a mention to qualifying. Lewis Hamilton on pole position once again set the fastest average speed lap in the history of Formula 1. Uh, I think it was a 118.8. It was a uh, an average speed of 164.2 miles an hour. Pretty brisk. I would yeah. say that's the fastest lap in F1 history, but I fear the second layout of Bahrain later in the year may have something to do with uh, I have to say about that by the time we get there in November. But for now, we like a cool record, and that is a cool record. Valtteri Bottas just behind um, by a nice number of thousands. Um, if I do say so myself. And yeah. uh, to everyone's surprise, Carlos Sainz, third for McLaren. I still have no idea how good this car actually is. Oh, um, man. And I mean, if you did listen to Carlos Sainz's radio, who, who, he, what, he was... What did he say, King? They, they were a bit frustrated. They, Carlos thought mm. he was going to get the win. He, he really thought if, if the race was just one lap longer would have had the win yeah because it seems like where this car is really quick is on high speed circuits like red bull ring monster Austria, they, yeah yeah they built a pretty efficient car and credit to mclaren uh they've they had a weapon this weekend i i you would figure that if anybody was going to be the favorites to win if the sky fell out and all of our top three teams mercedes red bull and yes we still consider ferrari one of the top three <laughs> if anything bad happened to them mclaren were probably <laughs> odds on favorites but nothing like that would ever happen because formula one is subject to the laws of inertia i think we were pretty pessimistic going into this race until We'll get into that um, because uh, yeah, the, the, we we had because it was a very topsy turvy sort of grid. I mean, yeah, Bottas was second to round off the front row, but we had Carlos Sainz Jr. in third. We had Checo on the second row in fourth. Uh, Max Verstappen down in fifth. He's normally been best of the rest so far this season. And he was barely ahead of Norris and Ricardo. Very very close fight on the uh, shall we say rows two, three, and four on that one. In case you're wondering where Ferrari was in all of this, um, Velo gets knocked out in Q1, Charles Leclerc gets knocked out in Q2, and my brother made a lot of money on this Discord server by betting that both Ferraris would get knocked out before Q3. Hey King, um, is this result good for Ferrari? Like, how bad is this? Um, well, my, my short film, referenced on an earlier episode <laughs> of the show, yeah, F Ferrari's still dead. <laughs> Ferrari's still dead. Well, Still dead, worst, uh, deader. Mm. <laughs> their, uh, worst cumulative qualifying results since 1984. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that was the last time both Ferraris qualified outside the top 10 at Monza. Um, Over 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah, not great. Anywho, race start. And, uh, oh no, uh, Valtteri Bottas has had a terrible getaway. Um, he's dropped down to fifth. Oh, thanks for coming, everybody. That was a fun race. Let's get out of town. Hamilton's going to win this by half a minute. Um, <laughs> both McLaren to make away. it. <laughs> yeah, and that's what everybody was probably thinking about twenty or so, for the first twenty or so laps of this race. Even after the first round of stops on the soft compound tire, we just thought, well, that's Hamilton gone. Um, he, he can dial it down and nurse the car and win this comfortably. But hey. You know, with all the traffic that's around, we might just get, you know, a McLaren on the podium. That would be nice. You know, there's a lot of people that, there's a lot of people that like Carlos Sainz. You know, Lando was up there, pulled off a yeah. brilliant overtake on Valtteri to get up to fourth. That was that was pretty cool. Um, the big flashpoint in this race, which we'll get to because the on-track action wasn't particularly captivating in the first half of this race, hmm. was Charles Leclerc. Charles Leclerc has a massive snap of oversteer. Um, on while going through the parabolica, loses control of the car, 
puts it in the outside wall. Safety car is called. Um, damage for the second the time. For the second time, mm. because if we rewind just mm. a couple laps, Kevin Magnuson has a power unit failure. That brings out mm. our first safety car, and we're thinking we're back to racing, and then as soon as we're back to racing, another safety car. And now both Ferraris are out because Sebastian Vettel's had a brake failure and is pretty much done. So if you're a Ferrari fan, you're thinking, oh, at least this is over quick. Yeah, I was delighted. I was like, this is a quick and painless death this time around. I know that the long excruciating one where Vettel limps home in 13th place and no one gives a shit. Um, I was like, hey, I've got an out this week. His brakes failed at 210 miles an hour. Uh, like, so, Jesus. So, as... During that first yellow, that first initial yellow where K-Mag's car fails, and it seems like, hey, maybe he's going to try to get this down pit lane. He he doesn't quite get to the entry. Mm-hmm. And during that first initial yellow stage, a uh, certain AlphaTauri driver comes down pit lane and takes advantage of this. Uh, mm-hmm. And the reason why there was initial yellow, race control is figuring out, how they're going to handle this, what, where they're going to, you know, how they're going to deal with Kevin Magnuson's car. They come to the quick realization that, uh, yeah, we're going to have to bring out the safety car. We can't do a virtual because people can still come down pit entry. We need the marshals out there yeah. to either pull Magnuson's car back behind the barrier or push it into pit entry. And it's like, hey, if we bring out the safety car, might as well just get it into pit lane. And yeah. that's what they did. Yeah, they couldn't. They could not fit his stricken Haas down that inside slip road just before pit entry. No, these cars are a lot bigger than cars of yesteryear. You can't fit a modern day hybrid down that lane, so they had to close off the pit lane so they could have the marshals push his stricken Haas down the pit road instead to safety. Oh, like so that even, means even if they had to push it back, they would still have to close the pit lane because the yeah, marshals would be standing in the pit lane. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's far too close. You're absolutely right. So yeah, the pit lane was closed. Remember that, it becomes very important two laps later, because once Charles Leclerc comes in, uh, Charles Leclerc hits, hits the wall, there's a safety car. No, no, Eventually, it, it, it re- happens It happens before then. When the first yeah. safety car comes out, a lot of people Sorry, are thinking, man. hey, the safety car came out, we can take advantage of this, we're just going to pit now. Uh, yeah. And this is the most important part of the race because Lewis Hamilton and Antonio Giovinazzi both enter pit have entered the pit lane while the pit lane is closed. Um, this is a serious breach of the rules, like for obvious reasons. You really, really shouldn't enter a closed pit lane. Like, yeah. just throwing that out there. I don't think that needs a long explanation as to why that's probably a bad idea. Um, stewards immediately look at it while the race is red flagged because off during Charles's second safety car, um, when that happened, they had to red flag the race because of damage to the air fence, uh, or yeah. just the fence in general. Yeah, RJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, shout outs to the F1 TV pit lane channel for being able to point out something because uh, Alex Jakes was right on the money. He spotted that the pit lane was closed as Lewis Hamilton was coming in. Meanwhile, Ted Kravitz is just like. Why is nobody else coming into the pit lane? Oh, Lewis geez. Hamilton's made it easy to win this race. Like, even yeah. before realizing. Me watching yeah. after the fact, not knowing about anything that happens, when I see okay. Kevin Maxon's car there, I just assume pit lane's going to be closed. Like, that was, in my mind, a no-brainer. I was freaking out when I saw Lewis pull in. Yeah, uh, <laughs> even I look... Even even in real time, I thought, hang on a minute, there's a car like 50 feet away. Why are you going into the pit lane? Like, um, like, like that shorty was closed. And I love that Hamilton tried to blame, oh, there's no, like, 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 like where's the, I thought the light was on on pit entry. There is not a light on pit entry. Yeah. Um, there's specifically not a light where, like, you would traditionally see one at the, at the end of the pit wall. Because at Monza, mm. if you're at that point, it is too late to back out. You couldn't pull out yeah. if you wanted to. Yeah, you're coming into that pit lane maybe at 150, 160 miles an hour at full racing speed coming out of the power of Bonica. You know, like, if you if you can see a light there, you're not getting your car stopped in time. I don't care how good F1 brakes are these days. Yeah. And so, at, at, they at, end- just to specifically point out, at Monza, the, the pit entry light is two light boards... On on the outside of the exit of Parabolica, 
pretty yeah. much where you're last going to be on the racing line before you decide to pull in. Yeah. Indeed. So, as the red flag is going on, um, the stewards are having a look at the incident. Um, it took about half an hour for them to fix the damage to the fence. Mm-hmm. And then the clangor drops. Uh, oh, we're not gonna, we're not going to mention bef- before that where Lewis gets on a scooter and goes. I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to mention this in the same sentence. Because uh, Giovinazzi and Lewis Hamilton both get pretty much the maximum penalty on the board barring a red flag, a 10 second stop and go penalty yeah. um, for entering a closed pit lane. And as King pointed out, Hamilton immediately gets out of the car, gets on his scooter and strolls his way to the steward's office because he wants a word of Michael Massey himself, uh, which I thought was cute. Well, Michael um, Massey's not the race steward. They're, they're, like, for the first time that I can remember on an FIA race broadcast, they cut to the steward's office. Not while Lewis oh, was they there. Oh, did, didn't they? Yes. But early on. And they list out who the stewards are. Uh, obviously, like, two guys no one's ever heard of because they're just pretty much automotive mm-hmm. executives. And the driver steward... For this race weekend, Mr. Lamont was Mr. It? Lamont, Tom Kirsten. One time prospective minority F1 <laughs> team driver, Tom Christensen. I will have it, you all it, know. It all goes full circle. So, yeah, uh, Hamilton uh, goes into the shoes office and has it out with Christensen. Although, oh, apparently, I know he's not race steward, but I know Michael said after the race, um, I know that uh, he said after the race that, oh, you know, uh, you know, it was a it was a great talk. Apparently, you know, he actually said there was no problem at all with Hamilton coming over and having a chat. We were, we were all for it, so that was nice. It was apparently all civil. Um, oh, so that's you know, so, so Lewis didn't throw his scooter out of the window or something. We didn't get like one of those like cartoons just where a, just a scooter comes flying out of the front window. <laughs> Nothing like that. Thankfully, it was all civil. Uh, but yeah, ten no, seconds. I was fully no expecting Lewis to get a tech there. Where's the technical <laughs> foul? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong sport. Wrong sport. We're, we're not um, in our basketball podcast just yet. No, Mar- no, Marcus Morris was not there in the steward's office waiting to step on his foot or something along those lines. Um, but yeah, as I said, 10 seconds stop go penalties for the pair of them. Meanwhile, Lance Stroll got a free pit stop because he hadn't come in yet and oh, he was yeah. able to change tires in the pit lane. Um, because we that were is all the thinking that Stroll was in the fucking catbird seat because, you know, he's got the tracing point and he's just made a free pit stop for tires, which last time I remember was like, that's pretty much how Ro- Haas scored points in their very first race. Yeah. Some yeah, circumstances. Yeah, because Grosjean didn't run, like, the first race they were in, Grosjean, remember that, uh, Ruth Buscombe was a uh, team strategist, and she was just like, yeah, running through the pit, stick the hard tire on, and we don't have to stop again during the race. Yeah. Perfect. Sixth place on debut. Love to see it. Um, this yeah. is an old rule that's come up before. I remember Monaco 2011 was probably the most famous incident of it when Pastor mm-hmm. Maldonado put it in the fence at Tabac, and Vettel was uh, under all sorts of pressure with Button and Alonso behind him running two-stop strategies. And then the red flag came out. Vettel was allowed to change tyres on the grid. Um, and that pretty much killed the race from a competitive standpoint. We're like, oh, well, what's the point of this now? He's on a fresh set, and that's how the race ended. And, uh, you know, Vettel, Button and Alonso right next to each other. Um, McLaren were not happy about this rule. Yeah, um, like, I Lando don't like it either. Was, uh, like, you shouldn't, mm. like, getting a free pit stop under a red flag. I'm not a fan of it feels competitively unfair like i'm fine with hey maybe i do have to change my tires but you shouldn't be able to restart the race in the exact same spot yeah maybe change it so it's like a back of the grid for the restart if you do change your tires maybe that might consider somebody worth taking the gamble yeah like Um, maybe that like you know you have to move to the back or maybe it's uh a five or a ten penalty. place, like make sure that it's positional places, not a time penalty, because time penalties don't really work under a red flag because everyone is stationary. Yeah, don't don't bring me back to those days of MotoGP and aggregate time back in the early two thousands. <laughs> oh, those were messy. Um, but yeah. no, you're absolutely right. I mean, there, there has to be some sort of opportunity cost yeah. to changing your tires in in the in the pit lane under a red flag because there's no punishment for that otherwise and. Like if you could do it, everybody could do it. I know obviously teams are limited for how many fresh sets they've got left in the back. We saw this during MotoGP in, in Styria with their red flag and how it it, it hurt Joan Mears' race, a race that he was probably going to win before Maverick put it in the catch fence. Um, like there has to be some sort of opportunity cost for changing tires in, in under red. 
Um, because a free pit stop is... You've basically saved like 30 seconds by doing that if you haven't had a mandatory stop yet. And that's just ridiculous. And I was not but a fan Dre, of that at all. And Lando Norris pointed that out. But yeah, but Dre, on, Dre. Uh, but Dre, I do got to say, you know what can really wipe out that advantage really quick? Especially when at the race steward's discretion, they decide to restart this race with a standing start is if you mm. completely bog the start. Lance Stroll, the start master, bogs it down. He has no grip in the tires. Oh, so yep. that's effectively his chance of winning this race from the front. Pretty much done and dusted because Hamilton has to come in at the end yep. of the lap to serve his penalty. Yep. So who they, gets they didn't, the top spot they, they, now? They didn't wait the maximum three laps for Hamilton to serve his penalty. He came in on the second lap available to do that. Um, I, I know Hamilton was already thinking, I can break out a five-second lead before I come in for this penalty, which I thought, dear God, in that message, he probably isn't joking. Yeah. Um, but uh, he comes in, and the most satisfying gif I've seen on Twitter of all time was seeing Hamilton with the onboard camera in pit lane for his stop and go just seeing his camera slowly come down the timing tower uh, as he serves his penalty. Um, on, the full, on the full racing conditions, remember, you can't serve a penalty on the safety car, so he has to do it when there's green flag conditions out. Works out about 35 seconds by the time it's all said and done. A run through the pits is about 18, chuck in another 10 um, for, obviously, the time itself, and then maybe another 4 or 5 for the uh, coming in, coming out part. So, yeah, it's about a 32 30 35 second penalty depends on the pit lane by the time it's all said and done i would know because the last time i've saw that i've seen vettel serve two of those in the last three years anyway it 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 put a certain someone to the front of the queue and it was one pierre gasly and uh amazingly gasly was at the front had a couple of seconds in hand meanwhile carlos signs had to fight his way to the front of the queue Uh he did he overtook Lance Stroll and uh, was He overtook uh, Kimi Raikkonen, who had yeah. his uh, his whole five minutes of fame, and that lasted about as long as... Some of it didn't last very long. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, the, like, bless him. I love, Al- I love Alfa Romeo for this, by the way. Props to Alfa. They're a team that knows they have nothing to lose, so they slapped a pair of soft tyres on this car, thinking they can go half distance on a pair of soft tyres. Way to go, Alpha! <laughs> I, I admire the boldness of your team to have a go and swing for the fences, even if you came up short. Unlucky. It almost got you some points. Bad luck. Um, but uh, yeah, that was the only real action, unfortunately. This was pointed out by a lot of people after the race that... You know, the top six didn't really move very much, but yeah. apart from Kimi Raikkonen sliding down the order on a pair of used soft tyres. Um, but it cleared the way um, for Carlos Sainz, and shout out to Lance Stroll, by the way, who pulled off a brilliant round the outside move on Kimi to, God, yes. to get him into uh, turn three, Lo- turn four, I should say. Lovely stuff from him. It, it turned into a one-on-one dogfight between Pierre Gasly and Carlos Sainz for the W. Sainz was reading him in at a rate of knots towards it, about three, four tenths a lap. I put it out there on Twitter that Pierre Gasly is about to win a Grand Prix of six to go, and I got a little bit nervous at the end there, thinking, oh no, am I going to get one <laughs> yeah, of those? Yeah, it was a little bit I'm nerve-wracking, I'm... because Sainz clearly had the advantage down the straightaways, but Gasly could just pull up so much speed coming through and out of the corners. Now, of course, that's a benefit of clean air talking, but that Alpha Tori looked like it was hooked up. It was hooked up very well, and I—that's why I was so confident that Gasly was going to ride it out till the end. But I think he'd pushed a little bit too hard, and I think his tires might have been a little bit too worn out because, like, I think it was the last three laps. Carlos had got the gap down to within a second on the penultimate lap of the race. He's in Gasly's DRS zone. Um, he had a couple of cracks in it on the final lap. It was a, it, there were always going to be audacious dive bombs. I love that. Again, team bosses, team principals are conservative. He got on the radio to Carlos and said, "One at a time, Carlos." And then later on, it was, you know, don't worry. Like second is good. Keep it clean. Don't do anything crazy. And then Carlos' response on the radio was, "I want this win, Tom." <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's all about right there, ladies and gentlemen. He went for the win. He tried maybe one lap short. If, if, if that race was one lap longer, Sainz gets a really good run in, into turn one. And Ooh, yeah. maybe, just maybe, he pulls that off. I would have loved to. I would have loved this race for it would have been one lap longer. But still, 
Who freaking cares? Pierre Gasly wins the Italian Grand Prix. I love it. Ooh. I love it so much. Think about a guy who was unceremoniously dumped by Red Bull middle of last season. Was seen as a fallback option when he first got the Red Bull drive. Was seen as a guy who just barely got over the line to win his GP2 title. Was beaten by the same Carlos Sainz to the title in Formula V8s back in 2014. You know, here is Pierre, the guy who's always been seen as second best. And here he is, and he beats out a game Carlos Sainz, and he beats all these other guys to win it. And I think that's special. And if you think that, you know, generally speaking... The nicest guys don't always win in Formula 1. I am so glad that it happened for Pierre on this day. It was magic. I had a tear in my eye watching that finale. It was it was beautiful. And, you know, I don't... Tr- I'm trying too hard not to glorify adversity because not everybody can handle some of the difficulties in life. But if anyone knows Pierre Gasly on a even close to personal level, you know that man's been to hell and back the yeah. last 18 months. You know, he, you know, we all know he was dumped by Red Bull in and out after 10 Grand Prix in the top flight team after a fantastic rookie season. One where he had a fourth place finish in his second ever race in Formula One in Bahrain. Um, you know, got the Red Bull seat, was dropped after 10 races, was lied to by management to, uh, you know, and, and the way he was treated amongst that team in Red Bull was pathetic. And, you know, he was the subject of humiliation on Drive to Survive as well. Let's not forget that. Horner was lying through his teeth about how they were talking about him. Into the fact, he was critical about him on 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 Netflix for the world to see. We we know how many new fans have come along simply via D two S and 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 season two and what it brought to the table. You know, he's gone back to Alpha Tower. He well, was Toro Rosso back then. He's been phenomenal ever since. He had that second in Brazil where he outdrags Lewis Hamilton to the line in one of the real images of twenty nineteen that. Uh, defied the season you know his we all know he, he lost his childhood friend Antoine Hubert at Belgium in the middle of all of that and he even had his house robbed as recently as last month he has had a goddamn rough time of it off the track and for him to turn that around and to win I, I called it the miracle in Monza it might technically be the miracle of Monza 2 uh, after what happened in 2008 but um, it was it was magic. Like the, I gave it a ten out of ten on my race review, and and it was an automatic ten because I did not give a shit about what happened on track from an action standpoint. Because this is a Grand Prix you always we, we will always remember. We will never ever forget this one. This has been a sport where I mentioned. This is the hundred. This was the hundred and twenty ninth race of the hybrid era. It's the. It's been a hundred and forty six since we didn't have. The lot uh, you know, we didn't have a big three member as we know it. Red Bull, Ferrari, Mercs win it. You got to go back even further for the last time you had a podium without them, over 150 Grand Prix. That was Hungary 2012 mm. when Hamilton was still at McLaren with the two Lotus of Grosjean and Raikkonen next to him. This was about as crazy a modern day upset for F1 that we've ever it. seen, and that is why we stick through. So many boring races. That's yeah. why we sit through Spains and Belgiums and, you know, mediocre GPs. This is why we sit through them, because once a season, or maybe once every two or three seasons, we get something completely off the wall. Once a decade. And this was that race. That's this, this, is, this, is a, this is a once in a decade sort of race. You don't ever, ever see that. Um, on on under normal circumstances, this was a a, a magical Grand Prix, and uh, man, did you <laughs> did you know that we, that Pierre Gasly was less than four months old when we had the last French winner, Olivier Panis <laughs> at Monaco, the ultimate race of attrition, and to believe it's been that long since we had a French yes. winner in Formula One, especially with how many French drivers we've gone through. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Jesus. It's not, it's not like they've been lacking talent. Jesus. Right. Um, I mentioned it as well, like, Parallels. First F1 Grand Prix winner in 24 years. First French Moto GP winner in 21 years on the two-wheeled side of the game. Thanks to Fabio Quattararo, he talked about it in her F. So, a good year for the Marciais, if I do say so myself. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it's... 
the 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 shot of of Gasly on the podium just taking it all in is going to be one of those legendary. It's going to be up there with Alonso's podium selfie from twenty twelve. It's just one of those magical shots where you just see him. Ta- he openly said it afterwards. He's just taking it all in. Yeah. And but having a thousand thoughts go through his head. I don't give a damn if this is the only race he wins. It could be he could be a one hit wonder, or this could be the first of many wins to come. But we'll always have those memories of the time that Pierre Gasly won the Italian Grand Prix at Monza in an Italian built car. Did you know someone from Sweden actually put twenty cents on predicting? I heard about this. How much did they get back on this? Thirty-three thousand euros. Apparently, it was one hundred and sixty-eight thousand to one. Get that Ish. money, son. If I was that Over dude, I'd be like, cent. "Why didn't I put down the full euro on it?" <laughs> Apparently, it was like twenty leftover cents in the dude's account. So he just plopped the twenty cents on a miracle podium, and he landed it. I've never seen a sporting upset bet on like that before. Apparently, it was one hundred and sixty-eight thousand to one. Uh, to, uh, pff, that what what's the thought process behind something <laughs> like that? Just like pick three names out of random on a dartboard and see what sticks. I, 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 Alcohol. I don't even know. Alcohol um, is my process. Yeah, probably probably some whiskey was involved. It wouldn't surprise me. What a podium we got though. Gasly, Carlos Sainz Jr., who gets his second podium in his F1 career and his, the best finish of his career. And Lance Stroll, his first podium since Baku. Uh, where he was third that day. He matches his career career high finish as well um, for Racing Point. So another plucky Racing Point podium, ladies and gentlemen. You love to see it. We we drew another... We we drew one a year from Racing Point, and we got another one this year. So uh, Lance, who, by the way, as a minor spoiler, now fourth in the championship. Yeah, Lance Stroll. What a guy. What a year he's having. Um, Let... Let's get into the full results and break down some of the stories in between. As mentioned, and I can't believe I'm saying this again, Pierre Gasly, race winner <laughs> in at Monza uh, in a so one hour 47 thriller. Uh, Carlos Sides Judy a second, just four tenths of a second behind. A last lap dogfight in Formula One. When was the last time we saw that? What, maybe Austria 2016? <laughs> Jesus. Uh, you love to see it. Um, Lance Stroll on the podium in third. Great drive from him there. Uh, just three seconds off the top as well. Lando Norris, the most disappointing fourth place finish you will probably ever see from the man because he was gutted on Twitter afterwards, but he said, look at how far we've come if we're upset about finishing fourth. Yeah. Kind of says it all for the McLaren team the way they've gone this season. Great result for him. Uh, Valtteri Bottas in fifth. Now... <laughs> He never recovered from that bad start. He he basically spent 50 laps looking at Lando Norris's rear end, which is something that's normally reserved for Twitter. Um. <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, that's good. Um, he had a radiator issue early on the race. They used the red flag to fix it. Apparently, what they fixed, it still didn't cure all the ails. And Dre pointed out, that, like, hey, one thing this Mercedes doesn't do, because it doesn't have to do that often, is uh, follow other cars. And I don't know if it was the way that Valtteri's car was set up or it was just his uh, mindset going into the race wasn't really attacking like it was when Hamilton was sent to the back of the grid, Uh, but he just couldn't make his way through the traffic. Shout out to all the goddamn ham capers that hit on me after the race had finished saying, oh, Hamilton went from 17th to 7th. If this disproves that theory, he's Lewis Hamilton on new tyres in a car that's two seconds a lap faster than the midfield. Come on! But <laughs> like... The thing is that it's... It's... It is... Like... Botas should be driving better. It's not a question. Like the reason oh, yeah. why, no, no, no the, the reason why he's having trouble overtaking people is that an issue that the Mercedes car has, where uh, it it's not designed to run behind other cars. Not not in terms of hey, uh, too much dirty air. More like hey, our car overheats too quickly. So if you want to pass someone, yeah, you does. have to do it quickly. Hamilton knows how to do that. He had no problem, but Botas couldn't do it. 
Yeah, you can see the amount of times in the second half of the race that Bottas had to weave out of the slipstream on straights to stop the car from overheating so much. It is a genuine Merck's problem. Of course, there's a little bit of dirty air factor in that for everybody. Yeah. I mean, even McLaren admitted that, yeah, the passing delta around here was still one to one second to 1.5 seconds in terms of pace advantage to pull an overtake off. But even so... Uh, apparently, according to Jason Bottas, may have had floor damage as well, which didn't exactly help his case. I think a lot of people also out there no, want to dump Bo- on Bottas that. didn't have damage. They said it after the race. They said it to yeah. Bottas during the race. Your car is fine. Right. Because he thought he had a puncher the first time after the bad start as well. Like, we called it the phantom puncher um, on, on social media. It's not, it was not a, a, a ringing endorsement of Valtteri. At all. And I know there's a lot of people out there that want him replaced in that car. I call it shiny hood ornament syndrome. Everybody wants the excitement of seeing a new big hitter. I I remember Danny Pedrosa had this problem for years in MotoGP. Where it was like, let's get someone new on the bike. And I was like, be careful what you wish for. Because that person ended up being Jorge Lorenzo. And we all know how well that one turned out. uh, Again, again. We we end up in a situation where like... they mentioned after qualifying, this is the first time that uh, Botas was on the front row at Monza, period. Like, this is not a recent development that Botas is not going through a slump. This is what he no, normally this is, is who, like. This is yeah. who he is. I've been telling yeah. people this on Twitter all season. This is who Botas is. And I've said it before, I think a lot of people want him to be Nico Rosberg too. Hence the mm-hmm. jokes about him having Sisu at the start of the year. Look, Bottas, to a degree, doesn't do himself any favors because he always talks about the improvements he's made in the off season, a new mentality, a yeah. new approach. And unfortunately, us on social media, we're predatory towards those but sorts of comments. The, I mean, we we'll dunk on people when they don't help their end of the deal. That but, that Cam said over the weekend that really stuck out to me. That it's like, yeah, Bottas might not even be a title contender. But he's not even being a good teammate right now. He's not even right. fast enough to be a rear gunner. He's costing the team points. Yeah, like, to be fair, this is the point where I was like, okay, it's actually worse than I thought. Like, like even last year, he still put up like 312, which is a good amount for a second Mercedes yeah. car. No one really had any major complaints about his season in general. You know, won a few races, didn't really do any major errors, just did his business really. We all know he's not Hamilton. And that's okay. He's going to open the door for Verstappen for second in the championship. Not the first time this has happened because Vettel did this two years ago as well. Yeah. But that was a more, I think, Vettel being spectacular than, or to a degree, in certain bases, than the fact that Ferrari still had, you know, a much more competitive car um, compared um, compared to Mercedes, compared to what the grid is like now. But this is genuinely a performance concerning problem. Tough break. He's already been re-signed for next year, eh, Mercedes? Uh, yeah, and that's fine. <laughs> They don't deduct your <laughs> Constructors' Championship earnings based on the margin with which you win the World Constructors' <laughs> Championship. So Mercedes right has on. nothing to worry about. Yeah. yeah, Botas talks a big game. Everybody has to do that. Nobody comes into a season hyping up how they're excited to finish second, third, fourth in the championship. But, of course, e- Everyone talks a big game, but no one talks a big game right after they lose a big game. <laughs> I said it before, that's kind of Valtteri's problem. He kind of said, like, I remember last year, he kind of set himself up here because he was talking about Sisu, the Finnish culture of, you know, perfection and, you know, being competitive. And then he goes and wins the first race in Australia. Mm. And everybody was like, porridge boss, Bottas 2.0. And then it all fell apart in the second half of the year again. And they're all asking the same questions about Valtteri we're asking every year. Maybe it is George Russell time after all. But hey, like I, said, I wonder if there's a buyout clause in this contract as King mentioned earlier. <laughs> More about that on the second part of this of this double header. Uh, <laughs> Daniel Ricciardo ended up in sixth. In, in case you're wondering, Lewis Hamilton ended up in seventh, coming back from seventeenth after that after that a ten second stop and go penalty. Passed a lot of those cars out there for fun. Got the fastest lap bonus, so he gets seven points. Uh, Esteban Ocon in eighth, who had a fiery rant at the Renault team <laughs> after, after the result and was told to basically shut up on the microphone by Cyril. This is yeah. not the time and the place. Yeah, they got a um, big problem with Esteban's attitude, which is why they're really looking forward to Fernando Alonso coming into this team next year because we know he would never do such a thing. This is the Alonso no. guy saying that. Give Esteban, get off Esteban's back for this. 
He just saw a team lower than him in the Constructors Championship win a Grand Prix. I'd be pretty pissed off too. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when the team put him on the wrong tyre strategy. Just saying. Like, you know... Like, I, okay. I, yeah, I the, get it. In... We're, he- we're heated that he didn't get that penalty from qualifying... But this wasn't yeah. something to be upset about. No, yep. no, no. Look, in those sort of scenarios, I will always back the man in the sweaty race car after an hour and 45 minutes driving a 200 mile an hour race car over the team 99 times out of 100. The one time being Fernando. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Sorry, RJ. Uh, ninth did he'll give it out in the end who must be feeling real egregious about that ninth place I were given out where his teammate fared. And Checo rounding off the points in 10th. And a shout out as well to Williams' best result of the year, Nicholas Latifi in eleventh. Just missed out on the points in the end. And uh, if you haven't heard his uh, final radio message to Claire um, regarding Williams, again, you probably already know the news. We'll talk about it in much more detail in our next episode. Um, very touching stuff indeed. Is in basically what we will call the uh, final Williams Grand Prix as we know them, so to speak. But uh, very touching stuff indeed from him and his teammate George down in fourteenth. Although I can't say I approve of him having Haribo and popcorn on a pizza. Oh, Check their social media for more on that. Um, <laughs> Romain Grosjean twelfth in the end. Kimi Raikkonen in P thirteen again. But like much much respect. To uh, for, for Alpha for the Bulls for trying to us on a soft tire there. I I respect that in this game of inches and calculated risk that Alpha threw the house at it. Points for Alpha Romeo, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, not literal points, but uh, Motorsport 101 points. They count too. Um, <laughs> George Russell 14th. Alex Albon, who just had a rough day at the office. Time penalty right at the start for basically not giving Pierre Gasly a car width. Which, who knows, if it damaged Gasly's car, we may have been telling a very different story about this race in the end. It's funny how some of these things turn out. Um, and even then, I think he had floor damage during the race itself, which I think crippled him all the way through. Just another rough weekend for Alex Albon. Uh, and Antonio Giovinazzi, who was pretty much in no man's land after his penalty, so he was down in 16th. One other name I haven't mentioned yet in this podcast, amazingly. Where was Max Verstappen? Well... After the restart, he was also he also had a similar problem to Valtteri. Was bogged in under traffic at the start. He had a bad start. Was down to sixth place, and then when the restart happened, power unit problem. Um, they they the Red Bull reckoned they were about to have a spectacular power unit failure, so they had to park his car in the pit lane before it happened. So a ooh. DNF for Max. Ooh, ooh, on, I have a take. I have a take. Um, Go on. I, I mean, this really isn't really a take because. Drave kind of brought this up, but why are Christian Horner and Helm Marcus still here? They would have been fired for this kind of performance if they had been wearing red shirts and uh, representing more Italian team for the performances they've been rolling in the last few years. No, to be fair, King made it like, like I, I did a, I did a post race Q and A on Twitter at two in the morning. Don't ask, I've got no life. Um, oh, but, buddy, um, yeah, like look. People were flooding my inbox with questions at two in the morning. I love my Twitter followers. They're fantastic. But uh, one of the questions was, I, I, I put it out there as a hot take. I said there was more grounds to potentially change Red Bull's management than Ferrari's for the one spontaneous bad year more than the, quote, seven mediocre ones that Red Bull had. And to be fair, it was King. And I give him full credit for it. He made the most valuable point on this where he said, look, basically call it what it is. It's the Arden Grand Prix team. Yeah. You know, the, Demetrius is not going to, you know, move these dudes along by now. It's basically one great big marketing project for Red Bull at this point. And, you know, it's basically Horner's team. He's been team principal there for, I think, 16 years now. Dr. Marco is his He's most He's been their advisor. only ever team principal. Yeah. From the very start. So, you know, we're going back 16 years now, I think, to when Red Bull were first a thing. Um... I'm just thinking something, something the way that team has been running, there have been successes, it's not working. And especially when a dude who you put on blast on premium, over-the-top cable television streaming is out here beating your team while your team, while your senior team's out here doing nowhere. I can't even fault Alex Albon for this one. If anybody needs to go, I don't think it's Albon. Yeah, it's but never a good the- system. The situation, like, even if Dieter Matuschitz wanted to replace Horner and Marco, Horner's the, t- 
the team's only team principal. Uh, Helmut yeah. Marco, his official position is Formula One advisor to Red Bull itself. So when Madershitz asks for advice on who to replace uh, Horner and Marco, the only two people he has to ask for advice is Horner and Marco. It's just a sick system, man. Yeah, I'm it's, getting, it's, getting it's, sick it's, of the way it's, it's concrete. Run. It's it, it's concrete. It's locked in place, and I don't that's like not going to change. Like I said, like I said, strip the Red Bull away. Call it what it is. It's all it's all it's basically the Arden F one team at this point, and that's not going to change anything. From back soon, when Arden so. were good, two iterations of a Junior Formula Championship ago. <laughs> yeah, Jesus, and yet here we are, and we've mentioned it on this show before about the nature of that team the comprehension of that team how it's pretty much for stap and city at this point so much so that i distinctively remember marco going into this weekend more or less admitting that they didn't have the same parts on albon's car how he was somewhat used as a guinea pig really? in, in his own team and that might explain some of his shoddier performances i don't think it factors for everything but it was certainly an element as to why Max has probably been a bit better off in, well, I say a bit, but a lot better off in that team scenario than what it is now. It's just another strike against Red Bull in the weird mismanagement of their team. They've been this number one, number two built team now since 2010. I remember the British Grand Prix that year. I remember they took away Weber's upgraded wing to, to help Vettel out and how much dissension that caused amongst the team as well as other certain incidents in certain East Asia, West Asian countries. But besides that, you know, it's been it's been tumultuous at Red Bull, and this is no change. You know, this is kind of what Red Bull are, and I don't think that is going to change anytime soon. But a uh, like, quick look at the, at the standings and championships and whatnot. Amazingly, despite all the chaos that happened, and Lewis Hamilton having, quote, a bad day and finishing seventh, he actually still... Um, he still gains in the championship lead overall because Valtteri took chunks out of Verstappen, who DNF'd. So he's got a 47-point lead in the championship now over Valtteri, who's back in second on 117. Verstappen down to third on 110. Lance Stroll ahead of Lando Norris on the virtue of countback, <laughs> i.e. more fourth-place finishes, um, both on 57 points to round off the top five. Ooh, yes, yeah. Lance Stroll is the best of the rest right now. Yeah, is Let that, that the kind in. of guy you really want to just cut because daddy's money? More on that next show. Mm. <laughs> Indeed. Now, you know what's crazy as well? You look at the Wikipedia page at the bottom, it only shows the top five of the race. Ferrari is no longer on the front page. That should say a lot about oh, their state of play right now. Mercedes have a 123 point lead on Red Bull already, 281 to 158. Uh, McLaren now in third, still on 98. Racing point, despite the penalty, now on 82 points. They're still fourth. Renault up to fifth on 71, ahead of Ferrari. No, seriously. Ferrari are sixth in the Constructors' Championship right They're now. just trying to renew that rivalry from 2006. Just what, like in what? qualifying, Ferrari is trying to renew their rivalry with Williams. Down the bottom of the board, sure. Yeah, uh, Ferrari are on 61. Alpha Tauri now have 47 points after a big bump, from uh, a 27-point bump from this weekend, which I think might be the most points they've ever taken away from a race weekend. I'll have to check that one. Even maybe going back to the Toro Rosso days. Uh, Alfa Romeo still on two points. They've only had one car in... They've not had a car in the points since the opening round in Austria. Sigh! Uh, Haas on the one point, and Williams... As we know them, still on naught. Oh dear God! Um, what what more needs to be said here besides watch this race? Yeah, just watch the damn race. It is a classic. It's a classic. it is a classic. My God, I'm glad I can say that about a Formula One race this year. Jesus, <sighs> it was I looking bad it. for a little while, but uh, yeah, we love to see it here, folks. Like, it. look. I know we dunk on F1 a lot here, right? Yeah. None of us here would love to see a better Formula 1 race than us free. <laughs> like, it's 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 like when Brian Alvarez talks about when wrestling is bad, and he's like, look, when wrestling does well, I make a lot of money! <laughs> like, <laughs> it's kind of the same for us. When F1 has a good day, you listen to us more. It's great. We love it. We, make, we even joked about the fact that our third most listened to country now is Italy. Hi, our Italian friends! You got a home win! Lord. You love to see it! Yeah! <laughs> 
Should we get into the June news, boys? Yes, because uh, second best thing that I saw all weekend behind Pierre Gasly, getting that win for AlphaTauri, proving all the haters, the critics, the doubters wrong, Mick Schumacher in a red car, won at Monza with a perfect start. And I watched this with my father, who's a big Michael Schumacher fan. Oh, that was just, it was perfect. Wins the feature race and is now a serious title threat. Oh, yeah. Look, nature is healing. A Schumacher in a big red car wins at Monza. Imagine if the Tafosi was there, how nuts they would have gone if Mick Schumacher would have won. That would have been magical. Oh, well, I would have paid good money to see that reaction. Um, instead, we had cardboard cutouts in the stands. Mm. Yeah, but it's, it's not different than a normal Formula 2 race that I had a Grand Prix weekend. <laughs> Stop being uh, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> more Formula Two. Look, I I enjoyed this race. Um, I I really uh I really had fun watching this. And hey, shout out Luca Giotto, the uh the the resident fifth year fun haver, getting a podium yeah. at home. That was a good drive from him. We had Christian Lingard on the podium. He's had a bad run of form the last couple of weekends. So Lingard right back at the top again in Monza. Good weekend from him. There was one critical moment that pretty much won it for Mick. He was struggling to deal with his Ferrari Driver Academy uh, partner in crime, shall we say, Callum Eilot, until he stalls it in the pit lane. Oh, oh man. Cost him about 15 seconds and ended up dropping uh, Callum all the way down to sixth in the end for the time by the time he got to the checkered flag. But, uh, oh, Mick. Mick wins, and what he's probably a getting a freaking start, though. I don't uh, think we talked enough second. about this. It's from seventh up to second before you even get to the first chicane. That oh, was, was beautiful. beautiful. He absolutely nailed it. We know these cars have got dodgy clutches at the best of times, and uh, yeah, Mick absolutely nailed it. It was was second by going around the outside into turn one. It was a beautiful sight. It pretty much won him the Grand Prix right there, and then not that we knew it at the time, but uh, a, a beautiful start from Mick Schumacher. Wonderful to see. I. You know, he's racking up these podiums. He's now, it's now heavily rumored he's going to get a Formula One free practice session somewhere between now and the end of the year. There was rumors it was going to be at Mugello. Probably not now is the latest I'm hearing, but probably at some point between now and the end of the year, he'll be in, in a Formula One car for, for realsies. <laughs> um, you know, it might be Haas. You know, it might be, uh, you know, it, it might be Arthur. We don't quite know yet, but uh, it's looking like he's going to get an F1 test. And hey, yeah. we did mention Matteo Bonotto said a couple of weeks ago that, uh, hey, you know, Mick's next step is a Formula One team. You know, Ish. looking good for him. Looking good for him, shall we say. The sprint race. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, now, oh, boy. Now, I bet we were all rubbing our hands with uh, just, uh, like, oh, just it's, it's going to be a fat fest on Twitter because Dan Tickton dominated the race even after a virtual safety car to take the sprint race win. Until though, we though all I, nice- Before we mention what happens, I, I missed the sprint race live, but watching it, mm. I just saw one gif that, I, that also had me saying, what the hell happened? Where you see mm. the medical car pull into the race winner's <laughs> grid slot and Dan Tickton gets out like it's the start of an episode of Raw. <laughs> it was brilliant. That's exactly what I was thinking. I was going to mention this, but you're absolutely right. This was hilarious to watch in real time because you, you had the overhead shot. They have the park Fermi position point out at the top of pit road, and it's the medical car that pulls in, and then Dak Tickton comes out. It is just like a raw return on the, in the WWE. It, it's like, what's Dan Tickton doing getting out of the medical car? What's the medical car doing in the number one position? I have so many questions. Now, to explain King's hilarious gift, and please find it on Twitter, because it is, it is hilarious. Oh, I'm, I'm including um, it in the edit of the show. <laughs> oh, please do. Please do. I will pay you good money for that. Um, yes, please. Um, it was hilarious. So to explain what had happened fully, Tickton wins the race. Now, we, were all, we all raised an eyebrow because Tickton suddenly parks his car just past the uh, first chicane before Curva Grande and puts it in the grass. And we're all sitting there wondering, well, why has he gone and done that? Did he run out of fuel was the first question a lot of us came out with. And, well, turns out he kind of did. But yeah. not for the reason you'd expect. Now, to be fair, I had to delete this tweet because I was quite cynical because Tickton has had 
car management problems over the course of his season in Formula 2, more specifically with tyres and temperament. But uh, it would might have, it might have explained why he was so much faster than everybody else. Maybe he burned too much fuel. But then I thought there was a virtual safety car in the race because I think it was Felipe Drogovic who had it parked on the turn yes. one apex. Yeah, so it was... Drogovic got turned around at the uh, at the chicane by one of the tr- oh Nissany Nissany turned yeah, right, at the Nissany. first chicane. Back on form. Um, yeah, he he he, he flipped Drogovic uh, around at the opening chicane. By the way, like, if there's a tractor on the track, please make it an automatic safety car in future. Jesus Christ. Um, like, do not make it a VSC. Like, stewards, get this right. Like, people in the charge of race control, get this right, please. Anyway, now, it's made it even weirder because there was a virtual safety car in that race, which means cars are more likely going to have even more fuel than they normally would. So... It didn't quite add up for me when, when it came through that Tickton had been disqualified from the race result for not being able to take a fuel sample. Oh, man. Because the stewards had to come over a statement saying, no, running potentially running out of fuel is not a valid reason to park a car after the cooldown lap. So we all thought, okay, what if Tickton's result gets overturned? And it was. And then Dams came out of their own statement after the the result was changed to a disqualification. And then they said, well, our fuel, our fuel tank, our spec fuel tank cracked. And that led to a fuel leak in the car. And Tickton was using too much fuel as a result of the leak. Yeah. Um, And they, they, they asked, they, in their statement, they said they asked the series to service the car. Uh, Like, it, it's one of the things that I dislike about Formula 2 the most. It artificially rises the cost of competing in Formula 2. Yeah. The, the cars mm-hmm. are heavily controlled. Uh, like, yeah. there, there are a number of components that teams are not allowed to uh, alter or even maintain themselves, the fuel tank being one of them. You're not allowed to buy Formula 2 cars secondhand and run them yeah. in the championship. Yeah, yeah, you have to buy them from the series itself. Yeah, right. And I'm just thinking, like, this is, like, the only series where, like, this quality control problem really comes up, F2 and F3. Because you never hear about shit like this in IndyCar. You never hear about shit no. like this in Super Formula or any of the other series that Dallara supplies no, as a no. spec championship. It's just this ladder system. Yeah. I can't figure it out. No, because, again, like, you, you have to buy all your cars from the series itself. You, you're not allowed to buy them secondhand from other teams. Two... Uh, the series themselves has to maintain the spec components on your car. The team can't touch them, period. So if there if there's an issue with a spec part in the car, the series has to take care of it. You're not allowed to touch it. Then and- restructure the department that maintains these cars. Something. Yeah. Because this, this keeps coming up. They've They've been littered with reliability problems since they've debuted from dodgy clutches, dodgy gearboxes, and now a cracked fuel tank. This keeps coming up. And look, you guys are making me feel bad for Dan Tickton. <laughs> Do you know how much you screwed up when this is a thing? Yeah. For like Come on! The, yeah, Dan, we have, Dre has become sympathetic to Dan Tickton these last several weeks for a number of reasons. I hate it. I hate it with every fiber of my being, and here we are. <laughs> Now, as a result of that disqualification, it actually promoted Callum Eilot to the win. Man was due a bit of good luck, I suppose. Um, you say Eilot, who led a DRS train over the line himself. Um, so, yeah, and as a result, Callum Eilot inherited the ring. Christian Lungar got bumped up to second. And as a result of Mick Schumacher, who, by the way, had given himself an all sort of nasty flat spot of his tyres, and you could see the car vibrate on Mick Schumacher's onboard. So, uh third place in the end for Mick Schumacher in the end after a, another podium for Mick. I think it's fifth in the last six rounds now for Mick Schumacher. It's fifth in the last five races. It says it sits in the last seven. Yeah. And yeah. that makes it eight for the year in total, more than any other driver. Well, let's look at this uh, driver's championship because it was good mm. going into this weekend and it is still good, even though Yuki Sonoda broke down in the sprint. Yes, Uh, after the penalties are adjusted and all the other point scoring came into play, it is now Ferrari Driver Academy 1, 2, and 3 in the standings right now. Kanemaila leads the way on 149 points. Mick Schumacher 6 behind now, all the way up to 2nd in the championship now uh, on 143. 
Robert Schwartzman on 140 in third. And then just outside the looking glass, looking in, Sonoda on 123 and Christian Lungard in fifth now on 116. So, yeah, it is, uh, it's getting real close up there now. 33 points covering the top five in the championship. Still a handful of rounds to go in Formula 2 this year. But, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's getting real tight in there. The Ferrari Driver Academy battle we were all kind of hoping for. It's happening. It's on. And <laughs> it's, it's real. On. And if you're Marcus Armstrong, you're making plans for year two. And if you're Giuliano Lacey, you're thinking, is there an out clause here, even though my father is John Lacey? <laughs> <laughs> but oh, yeah, it's, it's been awesome I will also wouldn't overlook a late push from Mazepin in 6th, Joe in 7th they're, they're still oh, at yeah. triple digit points King, yeah. urgency urgency, Formula 3 is going to be over sooner than you know it this was the penultimate race weekend of the Formula 3 Championship, and oh my gosh yeah, we, we are on uh, DEFCON 2 in the American camp uh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Is, is that is that oversimplified version of someone's about to get liberated? Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're hoping that Formula Three gets liberated, but it, it, it's it, it's, <laughs> it's slipping out of our grasp. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. <laughs> like, uh, shall we say the American fumbled the bag on this one? Shall we speak? Not not entirely of his home doing. Uh, Formula Three had two races again at, at uh, Monza. And yet more qualifying hijinks. Uh, go out of your way if you want to see another train and the power uh, It's uh, always yeah. fun. Freaking <laughs> do something about it, race control. Anyway, Frederick Zesty Vesti uh, ended up winning the first race ahead of Theo Pocher. Oscar Piastri drove angry as all hell to go from 15th to 3rd after a chaotic qualifying session where everybody was trying to get toes off each other. What else is new in Monza these days? Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, it was bad news for the American camp on this Discord because uh, Logan Sargent got spun out. And that wasn't good. Um, oh. Lads, what happened? <sighs> I didn't watch this race live, but yeah, that was... That's, that's not good. This was not a good weekend for Sargent because that dropped him down out of the points under 26th. And then he was a non... It was a classified non-finisher of the race two down in 24th. This was a terrible weekend for Logan Sargent's title chances. Yeah, because we'll he ended up getting... Championship. He ended up getting to race two. He was 20... I think he was 20 or somewhere to start the race. Yeah, and 26th. Then, and then there was a funny quote because he got up to 12th in the early going. He was passing cars for fun. And then he says about halfway through, yeah, I can effing win this thing. Oh. <sighs> Until he goes and hits his teeth. Oh, yeah, it was, uh, it was the guy, it was the, uh, the guy whose name sounds like a freaking pharmaceutical uh, product. <laughs> yeah. Clement Novelak. Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, that one was kind of a shitty racing incident. Just one of those was. bad deals. It, it was all it was all sorts of messy. Piastri got a five place grid penalty for a separate incident. I'm still not quite sure what they're giving him the five places for, but here we are. Uh, Piastri was absolutely devastated. He had to be consoled by his DRS wing after being told of the penalty. Um, meanwhile, in race two, Jake Hughes would go on to take the win. Liam Lawson was gonna oh, came over the line in second, but. Surprise, surprise! Another post race penalty. Oh, he lost. No. He lost his podium finish. He ended up taking a time penalty. Um, he would fall down the order. It promoted Porsche up to second. And finally, long overdue, Smolia gets his first podium in Formula 3 in third, representing Russia. We love to see it. Iron Man himself was a fourth Zendeli up there. Uh, whew, it, it, was, it was messy, to say the least, on that one. Um, Lawson ended up finishing 7th after the time penalty was factored in. So, uh, yeah. Go find these two races. They were yeah. uh, chaos. They were good. To say the least. I need to uh, catch up on these. Yeah. And no, also, so Prima won another F3 team's title. Yeah. yeah. Just uh, need to say, Prima... Title Town is back. Title Town never left. It is still <laughs> here in, in, in its crowd and glory. Prima take the Formula 3 team. You have a, like fleet of ridiculous drivers you're probably going to have Arthur Leclerc next year like just just give them next year's 1-2 while you're at it yeah, Jesus yeah they're, they're pretty much on on pace to to lock out the <laughs> F2 team's title as you do 
Happens every time. But uh, yeah, in case, you've, uh, in case you guys didn't know already, Formula 3 season is about to hit the maximum number of rounds. It is the season finale this weekend at Mugello for Formula 3. And this is probably going to be your main event of the weekend. Two more races to decide the championship, and there are still six men eligible to win the championship. Oscar Piastri has 160 points in the lead, but as I mentioned earlier, he's got a five-place penalty for that first race. It will come into play, I'm sure. Logan Sargent, and I wonder which the other members of my show are going to be rooting for, given all three are American here. I wonder if Formula 3 might get liberated or not. This, this uh, is our but, time. Uh, We're not going to get any closer now. 2010, <laughs> 2010 in the first GP3 season, uh, Joseph Newgarden finished fourth in the championship. Mm. Um, 20, 20... I think things turned out well for Joseph, didn't it? Maybe. Actually, not, yeah, I made a mistake. Bad. 2010, Rossi was fourth. 2013, uh, 2013, okay. Connor Daly was third. Uh, let's not talk about Joseph Newgarden's time in mm. in in GP3. Uh, it all uh, turned <laughs> out well for all of them. Just somewhere else. Just don't yeah. talk about Rossi's 2020. Oh, At the end of the day, indeed. we got six title contenders. Tail Porsche on 136, Liam Lawson on 127, Beckman on 123 and a half, Vesti on 117 and a half. Any one of these drivers can still win the championship. And we gotta wake up early as fuck to watch this. <laughs> yeah. Get up. You guys are getting up at 3 a.m. to watch the Formula 3 season finale. That's what we like to see. We want to see America. Maybe come through because Britain hasn't got a dog in this yes, fight. We so you see know, America maybe finish first. Look, if you I've been on like 245 of these episodes. I basically am half American at this point. Like, <laughs> like, like let's go Logan Sargent. Although I'd be totally happy if I not skip after him because he's a funny man on Twitter and he seems like yeah. an all-round stand-up dude. <laughs> he's funny. We like thing. funny on this show. Uh, <laughs> if I <laughs> speak, I, 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 I will be in trouble. <laughs> in, 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 indeed so yeah that's your main event next weekend forget about Formula 1 at Magento it's going to be terrible probably um, that's your main event get up at 9 in the morning for it UK time you will not regret it. It's going to be hilarious seeing Formula 3 cars at Mugello. They probably can actually race around this place. It shall be lit. Uh, check it out then in the meantime also, uh, what before I end the show, James Gans on our Discord server saying Oscar Piastri and his DRS will have a wonderful celebration if they win the title. No, oh, it's getting no, like edge we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not going there this depth. <laughs> oh, don't, don't worry. I'm I, sure Matt Hardy would have his say in the matter. Oh anyway, <laughs> that'll do it for episode 261. Check back for 262 later in the week. Until then... Basically, you can find us one more time. We're on YouTube.com, Ford Test Motorsport 101. We're on Facebook.com, Ford Test Motorsport 101. Our Twitter handles, at Harrison101HD, at RJ O'Connell, at Ryan Eric King, uh, at CBuckby917 for Cam, who is here in spirit and was half asleep. God bless him. Um, you, you can follow us on Twitter at Motorsport underscore 101, and you can back us financially on, on uh, Patreon at Patreon.com forward slash Motorsport 101. Find us to early access to all of our shows. Until we catch up, probably another week away from that. So you know, keep it coming. Um, and if you like, boss, back us at the ten dollar level, you can get access to our supporters club and our Discord server, where you can listen to these shows live as they're being recorded, and get early access to all our video shows in the future as well. I've been Andre Harrison. They've been RJ O'Connell and Ryan Garrett King. Until next time, sayonara. Forza Minority, y'all. Grande Machina. Grande. Fucking <laughs> mackerel. <laughs>